every time you know you see something going on in your soil you kind of ask yourself why why is that happening or you see something going on with your crops or or with the uh, irrigation that you're doing or, or rainfall events and you ask just why did that happen and it kind of reinforces it and encourages you to keep exploring deeper and deeper and I, I told you there's really three components to this conference one is the regenerative ag component which we've been focused pretty heavily on this morning the second is an ag technology component and third is this connection between the soil and human health and I, I'm very happy and honored to be able to have um, our next speaker present to us he's a triple board certified physician uh, and he has done a lot of question asking of the why and discovering things from the human health perspective and has kind of chased it back and understands that connection to the soil. So here we are working from the soil forward and he's working at from, from the person uh, back to the soil. So it's an amazing connection and you're gonna really be blown away by what Dr. Zach Bush has to share with us on this fascinating connection between everything that we do and how life is connected. And uh, I just would ask you to put your hands together and give a big warm welcome to Dr. Zach Bush. All right, very good to be with all of you. I'm very excited to be on the front lines of the planet. It's just, uh, every day or every week now, you're seeing something in the news speaking on agriculture. Buzz terms like regenerative are starting to become almost a daily occurrence out there in the press and everything else. So we're quickly moving beyond a concept of agriculture and arguments over organic or not organic to the story of soil and the story of regenerative uh, cooperation with the microbes of the soil and how we're going to generate a more nutrient dense and more diverse experience for consumers and for human health abroad. But you know, broadly, I want to bring this back down to just some extraordinary biology that I don't think you guys get enough exposure to. Um, and so it's going to maybe seem a little bit uh, you know, in the weeds, if you will, in regard to some of the level of detail I'm going to give you in the next few minutes over what is the microbiome. But I think it's going to give you a sense of the importance of the work that you're doing as you're starting to really look at transferring your focus from crop yields and things like that to soil management and really understanding that being a primary focus or emphasis for a farm today, um, you're going to, I hope, walk away from this 17 minutes thinking, oh my gosh, you know, I, I was underestimating the, the vitality and the potential for this shift in the paradigm. We're going to jump in real quick to the human uh, and before we go towards soil. The human cell contains about one meter of DNA. So roughly from the tip of my finger to, to my chest here is a meter of DNA. That's a, a molecular strand of, of these little nucleotides that line up. And so these t imagine a, a microscopic thread that's about 100 times thinner than a human hair that's about a meter long. And that's wound up inside of each of my cells. And my cells constitute my body at the number of about 50 to 70 trillion human cells. 50 to 70 trillion is a very hard number to wrap your head around. It happens to be very similar to the national debt. The U.S. debt is currently about 50, 50 to 60 trillion dollars. So that's the only other number in nature that reaches this kind of magnitude. And so 50 trillion cells is interesting when you start to think about one meter times 50 trillion. That's, that's now talking about a distance that you're not really used to or my brain's not used to wrapping itself around. So let's put that into the context of something big that we maybe can eat, wrap our heads around. As we learned last night at the keynote, we're not using our brains fully. So we're gonna to try to push the envelope of your brain today and say, how far would your DNA go if we wrapped all of your DNA around Mother Earth? If you go to the equator and wrap, start wrapping your DNA end to end around Mother Earth, it turns out that we could wrap any single one of you two million times around the center of the Earth you would wrap around the equator two million times with the DNA in your body. Holy smokes. Nobody tells us this. Nobody tells us how miraculous life is. We look at a child, a baby coming out of the womb. We look at this extraordinary thing of childbirth and we, it blows our mind and it's beautiful. 
but there's no way that we can really appreciate the complexity and the mathematical extraordinary capacity of life to create this kind of data stream. Interestingly, only 1% of that DNA codes for your genes. That's a pathetically low number. This means 98.5, 99% is coding for something that's not a gene. There's a lot of debate over the years as to whether it was coding for anything, and so it actually got termed junk DNA. Because if you look at it in nature, 98.5% of everything is pretty much junk, right? And you have to like really weed through nature to find something beautiful. Of course, that's not how the system works. Everything's beautiful. Nature never does waste. But we couldn't figure out what the 98.5 or 99% of the genome was doing, so we called it junk DNA. The 1% that we knew was coding for something was coding for the genes. And so your genes constitute about 20,000 different genes that you receive as a combination from mom and dad. And that goes on to build a human body was our belief system. But the number 20,000 was so dismally low because we knew we created over 200,000 different proteins to make a body. And we had been told that one gene turns into one messenger RNA, which turns into one protein, and so on. So we thought when we started to decode the genome in the 1990s that we were going to find some 200, 300,000 genes. We were really convinced of this because we had already uh, decoded the genome of the fruit fly, which had 13,000 genes. We had also decoded the flea, which had 30,000 genes. So to find out that the human fell at 20,000 genes, <laughs> somewhere between a fruit fly and a flea, was really bad news for a, a species that had called itself Homo sapiens sapiens. We, we called ourselves wise twice. And so Homo sapiens sapiens only has 20,000 genes, and so it defied our understanding of what DNA is. In the end, uh, there's been a, a necessity to figure out what the 99% of the genome was doing. And it's only in the last three to five years that we're really starting to understand what this massive amount of genetic information, again, remember, this genetic information is enough to wrap around Mother Earth two million times. And it turns out it's very well preserved, meaning that mom and dad pass on the junk DNA just as carefully as they pass on the 20,000 genes. And so it starts to look like there's this very intentional purpose to that. And it turns out its purpose is to produce microRNA. MicroRNA does not go on to make a protein or, or do any structural uh, you know, contribution to the human body. And so that's why we couldn't figure out what the, the, its role for a long time. Until recently, when we started to understand the role of microRNA, these little snippets of genetic information that are coming from the 98.5% of your genome go on to function as the intelligence of the genetic information. These microRNA are the the co-activators and suppressors of the genes themselves, they actually will tell a gene to make over 200 different proteins depending on the microRNA environment. Imagine a template, a blueprint for a house that could build 200 different houses. That's literally what a gene is now understood to be. It's so plastic in its capacity to build 200 different enzymes or 200 different work, you know, working tools in the toolbox of life. And so we have this incredible plasticity to the 20,000 genes that we have, and that plasticity is being determined largely by these microRNA. And so it's not surprising that the junk DNA or the 98.5% of our genome is actually shaping that little 1% to do all of this diverse capacity of, of growth and a transformation that life does. So a single gene can produce over 200 different proteins. Your genome can pr produce, if you multiply that out times your 20,000 genes, over 4 million different variants of you today. Let me repeat that. You could build 4 million different versions of your body today depending on your microRNA environment. That microRNA happens to be able to travel. It travels outside of the human cell, which is much different than the rest of your genes have to stay inside the cell. The, the, the messenger RNA has to stay inside the cell. The proteins, for the large part, stay inside your cell. But the microRNA travels, and it travels out in the bloodstream, and it actually interacts with other species. And so not only does it shape our genome and the gene decisions that are made, it shapes the, the genes of those around us. Interestingly, the rest of the environment is speaking back to us. In your bloodstream right now, if we took a sample of the microRNA out of your blood right now, we'd find that 15% of the microRNA in your bloodstream is from the bacteria in your gut and on your skin, etc. The bacteria are setting into motion genetic decision-making to decide which body you build today. 
Another 15% of your microRNA is from the fungi in your gut, on your skin, in the air you breathe. Another 5% of your microRNA is actually from the genetic information in the food that you just ate. That's interesting. If you're growing corn or soybean or a tomato, there's genetic information in there and there's microRNA coming from that genetic information that when you eat it will go into your bloodstream and shape your genetic response to that food. That's a much different concept of nutrition than has ever been handed to you as farmers or me as a physician. What it means is that we are in a living, dynamic relationship with the genetic experience of our food. And so if you are consuming stressed out food, it's gonna turn on the microRNA of stress pathways in the tomato, or in the corn, or in the cow that's stressed out in the feedlot. And so when we start to consume stressed out meat, stressed out vegetables that are grown in artificial environments, never seen the light of day, hydroponically grown, we have to start to be cautious in our interpretation because it looks like a big red tomato growing on a hydroponic system, but we need to advance the science quickly to understand, is that tomato actually healthy? Is it actually in a non-stressed state or is it producing a microRNA stress response from the tomato that will then be passed in the bloodstream of the consumer to shape, shape a, a stress response to that food? And so this is a whole new paradigm, and it's going to become, I think, a really exciting thing as we come alongside of you in the, in the coming years to say, what if I can show you so that you can show your consumer that your tomato is less stressed than your neighbor's tomato? If the consumer could pay $4 for a healthy, happy tomato versus $2 for a stressed out tomato, would they make that decision? Given that information, a mother is going to make a much different decision for her, her family's table. And so that's where I hope this science grows to very quickly, and, and much of my efforts are to, to push this paradigm of science forward so that we can equip you guys with the marketing tools to say, I am taking care of my soil, therefore I'm taking care of my food, therefore I'm taking care of you as a consumer. And that will be a new paradigm, and we'll no longer argue over, is there calcium in the milk? We'll, we'll ask the question, what is the microRNA of that milk really showing us? We've been told that cancer is the most common genetic disease, and we find out now that the cancer is actually a result of a shift of the microbiome and a downstream effect of you know, the, micro, the gen genomic information that those microbes are providing. This study showed us that if you biopsy a, the breast of a woman with breast cancer, the breast with cancer in it always has this huge population of methylobacterium radiotolerance. If you then go on to biopsy her other breast that has no cancer in it, it's a totally different microbiome. She has sphingomonas in that breast as the dominant species. Both breasts have a, a, a diversity of flora that's quite extreme, but the dominant species changes if there's breast cancer there. And so with that information, the researchers thought, oh my gosh, I wonder if breast cancer is actually an infectious disease. The wrong bacteria gets into that breast and it creates cancer. So they set out to, to do uh, a correlation study showing the amount of DNA load from those bacteria versus the advancement of disease, expecting that the more methylobacterium present, the more aggressive the disease. And they found the exact opposite. They found out that the less bacteria present in that, in that breast of that woman, the more aggressive that cancer got, and the faster she died of breast cancer. What we find out from this study is that just like the soil in your, in your property, the human breast is an is a incredible organic garden that's thriving microbial ecosystem. And as it starts to become stressed, it makes stressed adaptations. When you stress the soil of a farm, what, what, what is the species that show up? We call them weeds. What Gabe Brown and others would call them forbs. These are important shifts in the microbiome in the macrobiome, macroecosystem of soil, to do an adaptive uh, effort to actually fix a deeper problem. And then we go and kill the weed with an herbicide, thinking that that was our problem. When in fact, the weed was there on purpose, responding to a damaged ecosystem, and the weed shows up to do a response. In the same way, we find out that methylobacterium is a weed-like organism that pops up in a damaged terrain of a breast, and we'll start to do damage control. 
if we then take an antibiotic and, and, and pressure it uh, into uh, disappearance, we will kill that woman with cancer. And tomorrow I'm going to show you the correlations in my talks around antibiotic usage and death from cancer. And the correlations are extraordinary. Um, state by state, you can see the number of antibiotics prescribed or the amount of herbicides uh, sprayed and the, and the impact on cancer death. So as we see these huge Monsanto settlements coming out in recent uh, year here against Roundup, why is that? What is the court system seeing that the EPA is not seeing? The court system is able to take a look at population effects, able to look at things that the EPA is actually legislatively prohibited from considering. And so the court system is able to get a, actually a much better look at what, what phenomenon is going on with this microbiome collapse. But to give you a, a perception of just how complex this whole system is getting, just a quick run through. We are one species with 20,000 genes. The mitochondria live inside our cells, are these little bacteria-like guys that have a viral genome. And they've got 37 genes, a very simple genome. But interestingly, they have 14 quadrillion mitochondria within our human body, which means that we're actually genetically way outnumbered by mitochondrial DNA than we are by human DNA when we walk around. Interestingly, bacteria with their 40,000 species in a human body is coming out to 1.4 quadrillion cells, you know, some uh, 10x that of, of the, the human cells, and have 2 million genes compared to our mere 20,000 genes. And so the genome of the microbes of the soil or our gut or our skin far outweighs the genetic capacity or genetic work of the human body. But it gets even more ridiculous. The two million genes of the bacteria are pale in comparison to those of the parasites. There are 300,000 species of parasites in soil and gut uh, microbial populations. They carry two billion genes. There's five million species of fungi in that microbial ecosystem. And that five million species of fungi have over 125 trillion genes. You have 20,000 genes. You have 20,000 genes, a little less than, than a flea, a little bit more than a fruit fly. You are really invisible genetically when you look at the genomic information on the planet. You are a consequence. You are being shaped by the microRNA and the genetic information of that level of microbial and genomic diversity. Then we get into the viruses, and we don't even have a clue. We don't know how many species are there. We don't know how many genes there are because there's just too many viruses for us to even start to com computate their gen genome. What we roughly know right now is that very conservatively, and this number could be actually 10 more zeros on the end of it, but right now we're going with 10 to the 31 viruses on Earth. That's a one with 31 zeros after it, viruses on Earth. We're starting to come to the terms that in your body right now, there's 100 different variants of retroviruses in your bloodstream right now. In a healthy state, you're living with 100 other retroviruses. Retroviruses became discovered and, and popularized by HIV. You're living symbiotically with 100 different versions of HIV in your bloodstream right now, and it's helping you live. We are not in a warlike state to the microbiome. We are trying to wrap our heads around this as physicians, as we've been trained for 150 years that we were fighting the microbiome, to only find out that there is so much microbiome that there is no way it's against us. The microbiome is for us. We would not have life without it. And so we are that incredible microbial diversity and microbial life. And it turns out that the brain is being shaped by that. Your gut interacts directly with the brain. Now we understand that the, the neurons that feed along the gut lining are actually sticking it, their nose out into the gut milieu, speaking directly to the bacteria. The bacteria are just like the neurons in the brain, capable of exuding some information out of their surface in exactly the same mechanism that one nerve speaks to another nerve through these little vacuole expressions. And in that, we find out that they prevent and, and uh, provide for, a they prevent depression and provide for a healthy brain function. One course of antibiotics for a human being now is understood to increase the risk of major depression by 23%. Two courses of antibiotics in a year, 56% increase in major depression. 
one course of antibiotics, 17% increasing anxiety, 44% if you've got two courses of antibiotics. So it's extraordinarily fast that we shift brain function when we wipe out the microbial workforce down here. When you grow organic and regenerative and you start to really diversify the microbiome within the soil, you're creating intelligence, you're creating real neurologic events in the plants themselves, and that's then mimicked in our gut and between our bacteria and our brains. There is something called quorum sensing, a hyperintelligence of fungi. When you get to a certain level of bacteria or fungi, they can think as a greater organism. They can make decisions on resource management at macro levels over hundreds of acres of, of size. They're making decisions in resource management. And so there's this hyperintelligence that the microbes are responsible for making, and that's been our expertise in our laboratories, is to find out that the brain is simply the central processing unit for the microbiome. The microbiome is the source of information. The microbiome is the source of communication. And our brain is just the gray matter CPU chip that's filtering all of this massive information coming in from that extraordinary microbial environment. So tomorrow, we're going to dive deep into that in my breakout sessions, and I really look forward to getting to know your stories and what brought you here. But I want to give hats off from the entire physician community on, on their behalf, a deep thank you to each of you for pushing the paradigm forward in understanding soil health and its impact on plant health and ultimately impact on our patients. We can't heal them without you, so I thank you for being here.